Okay, I guess we can get started. So, so as I mentioned, so so last time we discussed all the ergodic theorems, and we are um, we saw the proof of the subadity of ergodic theorem. So now the next um, tool from probability that we actually need to discuss random walks is, is Martingale. So, so first of all, we have to define a conditional expectation, which you might have studied in your measure theory or probability course already. So, but let's recall that. So in general, what, what is the notion of probability con conditional expectation? So, so we have a space X. Uh, yeah, but, and we have a two sigma algebra. So we have a, so X A mu is usual probability space. But then we can consider B in A is a sub sigma algebra. So meaning that of all measurable sets, we just consider some of them. Okay. And now we can Easily, we can we can look at L one of x with respect to b. You know? So these are the functions that are measurable with respect to b. So such that the pre-images of Borel sets are in b. This is a subset, is a subspace of L one x with respect to a. But first, this seems very abstract. And in fact, the definition is very abstract, but it, it, this can this actually happens in, in probability quite a bit. Usually, whenever you have a process, you can define some sigma algebra, which tells you that when you're considering only some outcomes of your random stochastic process, and then when you consider more outcomes, you have a bigger sigma algebra. So this is actually what happens. We, we will see more, more in, in it. Okay, so... So now let's let's define the conditional expectation. So given f in L1 of x a, we want to produce a, a function in this smaller space. So the conditional expectation And this is a function which we call it as e of f given a. And this is the only function that satisfies the following property. Is the unique, is the unique element. So this is a function of, of L1 x b mu such that so it's a unique function it, it's 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 in the smaller space and it has two properties okay so first one as i said already so unique element call it g okay so again g is in l1 of x v mu and the second is so it is measurable with respect to the smaller sigma algebra and the second part is that the average stays the same in the following way, that if you take the integral of f d mu on every b is the same as the integral of, of g d mu in b for every b in the smaller algebra. So for, for so basically, you, you have a function that is measurable. So that you see the pre-image of, of Borel sets lies in this wild algebra. There, there are strange, possibly complicated sets. And then we want to make a function that is measurable with respect to the smaller algebra, meaning that the pre-images are better behaved. And so the idea is you kind of project, once again, so... You, you find a new element in this space 
that is measurable with respect to the smaller sigma algebra. And also, whenever you take a test set, which is in the smaller algebra, the average is the same. Okay? So this is the statement. And so, well, the existence of this is not really that, that easy uh, to show, but we will take this for granted, the existence. And so what are the pro properties? So the proposition about properties of conditional expectations. So what are the properties? So, so first of all, is, this is linear. So first of all, is for every lambda, some, some, some scalar in, in say R, and for every F and G in L1 of X, a, yeah, I, I drew it like this. Then, well, the conditional expectation of f plus lambda g given A is indeed linear, is conditional expectation of f plus lambda conditional expectation of g. So this is not so surprising. The other thing is if F is B measurable already, well, what is the conditional expectation of F? Oh, sorry, this is B. Yes. <laughs> we take the expectation with respect to, oh, B, B here as well, sorry. Yeah. So, so we take, uh, what is the expectation of F con conditional on B? Well, what do we want to do? We want to find a function that is B measurable and it has the same integral as F on every B set. Well, if F is already B measurable, <laughs> then uh, you just take F itself already works, right? So this is kind of, so far it is a bit, dry but but we'll see what else so the second thing is if if f is independent of the random variables of x1 xn random variables so you take any random variables defined on the same space well what is the expectation the conditional expectation of F given the sigma algebra generated by X on Xn. So what is the sigma algebra generated by X1 and Xn? Well, this is the smallest sigma algebra for which X1 and Xn are measurable. So such that, so that it contains all the pre-images of Borel sets by this. And so this is literally just the expectation of F. So it's a number. Because, yeah. So, so this is because they, they, they are independent events. So, so in some sense, having you know, the information that you know the outcome of X1, Xn is irrelevant to your best guess of the, to the expectation of F is, is, just, is just the integral of that. So we will see examples of this because yeah, this is a bit formal, but actually it, it's a very important uh, notion in probability. It has a lot of usefulness. So maybe are there any questions about the definition? Yeah. When we have the um, existence, uh, that's given any subalgebra? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. So every given, given two pairs, of, of of sigma algebra, so this this exists. Okay. okay, so well, let's see. Maybe maybe some examples. So let's see. Yeah. By the way, yeah. By the way, we can also add the remark. What is the sigma algebra generated by by x one x n? So given x one. Xn sigma 
of x1, xn is the smallest sigma algebra that makes each xi measurable, meaning what? Meaning that sigma of x1 xn is the sigma algebra generated, sigma algebra generated by xi inverse of of a Borel set, so B, right? Such that I is in one N and B in, is in a Borel sigma algebra of R. Right. So yeah, so we, so again, this seems very abstract, but actually in probability, this comes really natural when you have a sequence of random events. So, so let me start, so let, let's see examples. Okay, so, so here's an example. So suppose you have Xn, random variables, And each xn from your space x or omega, or let's call it maybe omega, to zero one. So, for instance, you know the classic pointers. So, suppose that these xn that you're looking at are draws of some random variable. So, what does it mean to condition on sigma one, sigma xn? Yes, it, it basically means that you can assume what is the outcome of, of these variables. Because you see, what are the measurable sets here? Well, the measurable sets in this sigma algebra is like you either you decide is the preimage of one or zero. So it's either you, the set where the outcome is one or the set where the outcome is zero, right? So maybe we can say that the sigma algebra generated by X1 Xn is, you see, is the set of, you know, is, is every set is of the form. Uh, right, so x1 equals a1, <laughs> a xn equals a n. So this is a, where, right, such that, so yeah, <laughs> such that a, a1, An are in 0, 1 to the N. So certainly contains all those sets and, and basically basically these are, these are all, all the sets. Like, yeah, okay, maybe, yeah, just any, in fact, you can select not just, yeah, you can even select only one or two outcomes and it's, um, this is one measurable set in this in this sigma algebra. So yeah, so this is definitely yeah. This is uh, essentially it's it's almost yeah. It's it's exactly almost the same. Maybe maybe we can even say for a subset. So x one x one x a one and yeah. If you want to be precise, you want to say there's a subset, right? So x i one equals a one. X I R equal A R, some some A R zero R R plus N. So you you can uh, yeah prescribe the outcome of whatever R out of this N variable. Okay, and now what happens when you do the conditional expectation, right? So let's compute the following. So what is F expectation of F given sigma of X one? So f is a function, and now I do this first coin toss, and I want to condition on the first coin toss. So, so what do I do? So there's two options. So either 
either the first coin toss is zero or one, right? And if the first coin toss is zero, well, I take the average of S of F given, given the fact that the first coin toss is zero. And then I take the average of F given the fact that the, sec the first coin toss is one. So, so here's what we get is the, so we define C zero as X one inverse of zero and C one as X one inverse of one. And so here we get the characteristic function of C0 times the average of F, uh, we call it mu or P, let's say mu, right, over mu of C0, over C0 plus one of C1, F C1, C mu over of C1. So you see, this is a function. It's still a function, but it's a much coarser function. So F could depend on uh, many, many things. So if we just don't condition at all, we're just taking the expectation of F. This is a number. Now, here we're conditioning on the first outcome. So it's still a variable. But it's a much simpler variable. It's a variable that has two uh, two values. If the first digit is zero, you're taking the average of f on the set where the first digit is zero. And if the first digit is one, you take the average of f on the space where the first digit is one. So this function, now it's measurable. We respect the much smaller sigma algebra, which is this one. OK? So, okay, now when when we have, maybe we can look at really some exercise about this. And also for notation, notation, sometimes we also just write the expectation of F given X1, Xn. Well, this is just the same as the expectation of F given the sigma algebra, same thing, okay? So now, yeah, so now let's look at an exercise, for instance. So let's say again that we are doing a coin toss. So Xn are just zero, one, random variables, they are iid, and the probability of x n equals zero is one half. <laughs> Suppose you do the usual coin toss. Okay. So now, and you define s n as the sum of the first n variables. So what's the expect conditional expectation of S100 given that X1 equals X2 equals one and X3 equals zero? So suppose I tell you already what is the outcome of the first three variables, right? So you see, because if you just condition on x1, x2, and x3, you're gonna get a function which depends on the outcome of the first three. So now I even just give you what is the outcome. So now this becomes a constant. So what is the constant? Okay. 49.5, something like that. So <laughs> So something like that, right? Because, because what? Well, because what is this? This is, right. So this is the expectation of, well, X1 plus X2 plus X3 plus everything else from four plus to a hundred, right? Given, so this is by, this is, well, literally the definition. And then, 
and, and then what? Well, by you see, you know, we know the expectation of x1 plus x2 plus x3 given this guys. Plus the, the rest of the sum. Let's see, let's see why is that the case? Well, so because you see now this this function, yeah, this function is already measurable with respect to the sigma algebra. So we can tell its value. And so what is its value? Well, <laughs> it's gonna be two, <laughs> right? Two. And what about this guy? Well, here in this case where this is independent of that. So since they're independent, the fact that I have this information is completely irrelevant. Your best bet is to just take the average of this. And so what's the average of that? Well, it's one half time, nine, nine, times the number of trials. So this is one half times what, 97? Yeah, so that's uh, what it is. I know. <laughs> yes, so this is what, is it 50 per time? Yeah, okay. So, okay, so this is, um, this is an exercise to re remember what is the conditional expectation. And now, why, why do we care about conditional expectations? Because indeed, uh, to define martingales, the definition of martingales is given in terms of conditional expectations. Okay, um, so oh, by the way, another a, a type of conditional expectation that we really want to look at is the expectation with respect to the invariant sigma algebra. So once again, so if you if you have you know x a mu t a measure preserving system. Okay. And so you can define the follow the invariant sigma algebra, the invariant sigma algebra as, and we call it a t. Well, these are all the sets in your sigma algebra that are invariant under, in fact, up to measure zero. Okay, so, so here's a question. What are the functions that are measurable with respect to this sigma algebra? So note that F is AT measurable. So you see this measurability seems like a very abstract concept and it kind of is, but it has interesting interpretation. So what is a function that is immeasurable with respect to the invariant sigma? Well, this means that for every C in R, if you look at the set of X, such that F of X is bigger than C, this has to be in the invariant algebra, right? So what does it mean? It means that this has to be equal to its pre-image. So this has to be equal to what? To its pre-image. So what is the pre-image? Is the pre-image is the set of x such that f of t x is bigger than c. So what can we conclude from this? So you see, you have a function such that the sublevel sets or superlevel sets are invariant under T for every level. So F has to be invariant, right? 
So this as a corollary, this shows that F composed with P has to be equal F almost should. So you see, there is this notion of measurable for this, for this sigma algebra. And this captures something very dynamic, like invariant functions. So this is kind of neat. So this, in, in dynamical context, this is a really, really important sigma algebra. And in fact, maybe you can start guessing what happens. So the pro proposition is like this. So what is the conditional expectation with respect to the invariant sigma algebra? Right. So again, so you start with x a mu p, a measure preserving system. Then for any f in L1, well, what is the expectation of f conditional on the invariant signal algebra? It's an invariant function that has the same averages as f. So what is it? Well, f is not half is not invariant. Uh, yeah, f is anything to start with, oh. right? So f is not invariant, but as as you said, like so, this is what we called before f bar, which is the limit as n goes to infinity of the Birkhoff average. So you see, we we see once again this this ergodic theorem coming up in this interpretation that. You see, we also saw that the operation f bar is a projection from the set of from measurable functions to invariant functions. And it's also projection in the following sense that it's the conditional expectation of f with respect to the invariance of function. So everything kind of checks out, which I think is a beautiful thing. Okay, so now, yeah, so, okay, we can prove this. So we need to check by the existence and uniqueness that F bar satisfies these properties. So first of all, we have to check that F bar is an L1 X A T. Well, this, this we know by Birkhoff's theorem, right? So this is by Birkhoff's theorem. We already proved that. And now the other thing that we have to show is that for every B in AT, so for every invariant B, the integral of F bar, the, the mu, equals the integral of F, D mu. Okay, so for that, it takes just, just a little bit. It's not, not, not too complicated. So first of all, so we can consider, we can consider the usual um, splitting in F is F plus minus F minus, taking the positive and negative part. So what is F plus? Well, F plus is the max of zero and F and F minus, Right? Well, it's the negative part. Well, we can define it just uh, <laughs> by, by, by difference, but this will be negative. So F minus would be F plus minus F, and this is always negative. So by doing this, the composition, we can assume that F is positive. Like we start, we do it first for F plus, and we do it with F minus. Okay. Okay, so assume so assume f is positive. 
And so now what we do is the following. So the integral of f bar d mu over b, well, this is the integral of one over the li sorry, the limit of one over sum of f composed with pi, i equals zero to n minus one d mu. So this is the integral of the limit. And how do we comp compare it to the limit of the integral? Are they the same? So here we have the limit of the integral. So how do we compare the integral of the limit with the limit of the integral? What is the classical lemma? But two lemma, and in fact, it requires that I was positive, so that's why. And so the integral of the limit, it would be, is less or equal than the limit of the integral. Okay, very good. And now here we're in good shape because B is invariant and, and, and T is measure preserving, right? Okay, we use dominated convergence. The issue is, how do you dominate this? Right? So point was, so okay, you see, maybe you can use dominated convergence, but I don't see how it, it's trivial. Because you see, each, each f is in L1, but f composed with t, you know, the max of f could be in various places where you when you compose with t. So I, it's just not completely trivial. Maybe there is a version of using. Okay, so so but anyways, so here we are good to go because because each of those is just the integral of f, and you take in the average, so this is just the integral over b of f d mu. So this gives uh, one half of the inequality. So now let's look at the other half. So the other half is by truncation. So we let Fn, the minimum between F and N. So N is some number to truncate. And since F is in L1, then, yeah, so then there exists, so for every epsilon, there exists N such that the integral of Fn yeah, yeah. Basically, the integral of f is not bigger over the whole space. is 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 almost the same as the integral of the truncation, right? Because the total integral is is fine. So we can truncate such that this integral is a bit smaller, but really not much smaller. Okay, and then we apply dominated convergence because because this is bounded. So by dominated convergence. The integral of fn d mu b is the limit as n goes to infinity of one over n. The integral of fn composed dti d mu. Right, this is. Uh, Right, this is not even dominated convergence. This is just uh, writing out the invariance. But then, by dominated convergence, we can we can flip the limit with the integral. And okay, this is less than the integral of f yeah so we can replace this by 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 f
like that. And this one, yeah, this should be the integral of f bar, right? By definition, so this is the integral of b of f bar d mu. So the integral of fn is less or equal than the integral of f bar. And the integral of f is less or equal than f integral of fn plus epsilon. And so, so we're done, right? So from here, we get that the integral of f d mu is less or equal than the integral of f bar d mu plus epsilon. So yeah, so not only, you see, in the classical ergodic theorem, we say that f and f bar have the same average, which is true. But it's also true that they have the same average on each invariant set, which again, if the system is ergodic, which is how you usually apply it, it doesn't make a difference because the only invariant sets is either full measure or measure zero, but if there are other invariant sets, it's still true that the average of the Birkhoff average on an invariant set is the same as the average of the original function. So, so far so. Are there any questions, comments? Okay, very good. So, okay, so now we are ready to give a definition of Martingale. And we can state the Martingale convergence theorem. Okay, so and uh, yeah, so we already we already noticed that if if a, if you take f and l two, then the, this is the orthogonal projection. So the same remark we actually we already noticed that if f is in l two, then the expectation of f with respect to AT is the orthogonal projection. Of F onto L2 invariant. Yeah, this is where it is. Okay, so <clears throat> now we can define martingales. So what is the idea of a martingale? Well, the idea of a martingale is that the martingale is the outcome of, an, of a fair game. So let me write that. And here, the fair fairness of it is the important point. So here's an example. I, you know, I, I, I play with, with someone, you know, with, with, with coin tosses, for instance. And at some point, so I, if, if, you know, if it's heads, I win a dollar. If I tail, I lose a dollar, right? And now at some point I'm playing and after 10, 10 uh, rounds, I'm up a hundred, no, a hundred, you can't, I'm up seven dollars, <laughs> okay? So now you see the scene, you see that after 10 rounds, Julia is up for seven dollars. Now, you 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 go away and okay after and you know that they played another twenty rounds. So now, if you want to guess, you know what would be the best? What's your best guess to, of the wealth of Julio after a hundred rounds? You know he was winning 
of seven dollars after 10 rounds? What's your best guess after 100 rounds? Seven? Anyone else has more? Is that different? Yes? Exactly. So this is, if this is really like usual coin toss, your best guess should still be seven. Of course, if you didn't know anything about the game, your best guess would be zero. But given that you already know the outcome of the first seven, then it's easy to, I mean, it's not, it's not easy because in this case, the variance would be very large for other, you know, up to a hundred steps, but, but still that's the best guess. That's the expected, expected value, right? Yeah, it's like if I ask you to, you know, estimate the richness, the wealth of an average American, and then, okay, maybe you could say at 50, and maybe you say, okay, it's, uh, I don't know, $200,000. But then if you find out this guy's Elon Musk, and you know at 49, he has $200 billion. And I guess, oh, how much will it be? When it's 50, well, you know, it could be a billion, 99 billion or something. It's not going to be 200K. Okay? So that's, that's the point of conditional expectation. So, so the definition is the following. So a sequence, a sequence, Xn of random variables. is a martingale if the expectation of xn plus 1, given that you know all the history, x1 up to xn. So I know what happened until yesterday. What's your best guess for your average well, today, if you know the history until yesterday, well, your best guess is that you were still going to be as rich as yesterday, just accent. Okay. So this is still a random variable because it depends very much on your past. But for the, the, the future, well, you don't have any good, better guess. Of course, uh, things could go better or worse for you, but that's, that's your guess. Okay, and clearly you have a notion of super martingale and sub martingale if, if you have inequality. So it is a sub martingale Yeah, so this is a pessimistic pessimistic notation. The American dream is dead. A super martingale is if you're gonna, on average, you expect to get richer tomorrow. Okay, so what is an example of marking L? We, we kind of said it, for instance, whenever you have IIDs run in variables with average zero, then that would be a marking L. So example, if X and R I I D with expectation of each of them zero, then the new marking at yn, which is x1 plus xn, is a marking. Because clearly that you can, if they're independent, once you can even once you condition on x1 xn, well it doesn't matter. Yeah, you don't that what x xn plus one doesn't matter, right? So you can do at e of y n plus one given y one y n given y one y n is the same as given y x one xn. 
So this is the expectation of xn plus 1 plus xn plus plus x1 given x1 xn. So these cards are already on the table. There's no guessing involved. So you just have to guess the next one. But the next one on average is going to give you zero. So this is x1 plus xn. These are already collapsed to a natural number. You don't have to do any average anymore. And you have xn plus 1 given the previous ones. But it doesn't matter because this is independent of the previous ones. So this is just the, of course, if the expectation was positive, then this would be a super martingale. If the expectation is negative, this would be sub yeah. So this is x1. So that's why random walks and martingales are really, really close to each other. OK. So OK, so now basically we can, we can the, we can uh, give the statement of the martingale convergence theorem, which, as I said, in a way, is the last ergodic theorem that we're going to discuss because it's not quite in the same setting as ergodic theorems, but it has lots of similarities. It's it's take it's it's telling you that certain average exists as time goes to infinity. So okay, so here's, so if you have Xn, everything is in L1 of omega, respect to measure mu, be a sub martingale. And you want also some integrability condition. And it's a, yeah, it has to be for it. There are many variations, but for instance, it would be enough for us to say that the supremum of the expectation of Xn plus, so the positive part of Xn is uniformly bounded. So for every n, this integral is always bounded by the same constant. Then there exists so random variable x infinity from omega to r, such that the martingale converges again almost surely, such that xn converges to x infinity almost surely. So you see the sub martingale condition. It's very similar to the sub-additivity condition that we had in Kingman, right? And I think you can formally uh, pass from one to the other. They're not equivalent, but but in certain cases you can apply either. I mean, your 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 xn is basically this this cos cycle, so 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 very similar. Sorry? Oh, does the symmetry for cycle going to be the sub No, no, no. This Xn is each each of them. So for yeah, in, in, in our statement, what we had for the subadditive cycle was a n divided by n. So that's the yeah, this would be the the right parallel. But I don't think they, 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 they imply each other. But I, I think in, in several situations, it could maybe apply one or the other. Yes? Well, I think like the definition of some like the, the expectation is uh, should be greater than the expectation of x is greater than Right. Well, either way, the, the theorem works in both 
in both for sub articles and super articles. So it's a matter of definition. So this makes sense to me that this would be the definition, but maybe some other people use the other convention. Yeah. So well, I can double check what is the most common convention, but yeah. Okay. So yeah. So of course, so the, basically, the same is true for super martingales, except instead of plus. You want the negative part to be integrable, because you see, I mean, so, so some article has this property that the x n plus one is less than the x n. So if you, uh, you you always want an upper bound. So once you have an upper bound, you you get another upper bound for the next term and so forth. Like yeah. Okay, so. Okay, so here's an example. So let's finish maybe with this other example, which is kind of kind of neat. It's not the usual one. <laughs> it's like this. So so you start with a sequence xn of IID variables with the following distribution. The proposition probability of xn equals zero is the same as the probability of xn being two, which is one half. So this variable is either zero or two. Okay, and then the question is this: then if you consider y n not the sum but the product of this. Is a martingale. It's kind of neat because it's multiplicative, but it still is a martingale. Let, let's try, right? So E of y n plus one given y one y n. So yeah, what happens, right? So you know everything. And the nth plus one is the multiplication of yn times xn plus one. So this is the expectation of xn plus one times yn given, for instance, given yn. But now yn and xn plus one are independent. So you can take out the yn. So this is yn times the expectation of xn plus one. And so what's the expectation of xn plus one is one because it's zero or two with probably the one half. So this is yn. Now, is this martingale integrable? Let's see, is it integral, right? So, right, so we want to compute the expectation of yn. Well, if you think about it, it's a product of zeros and twos. So the only way that this one is non-zero is if all the outcomes are two, right? So this happens, so this is, Two to the n with probability one over two to the n. That's the only outcome. Otherwise, everything else is zero. So this clearly is one. <laughs> so this is integrable. And so it is, so indeed, there is y n converges to y infinity almost surely. Yeah, the question here is that does it also converge in L1? <laughs> Here's an axis. 
does yn converge to y infinity in L1. This is up to you to remember. So in a, in a Gardic theorem, we have convergence almost surely in L1. Yeah, we have convergence almost surely. But the integral is always one, right? So if it has convergence in L1, then y infinity has to have integral one. But what do you think is, what do you think y infinity? Yeah, it's going to be zero. So, so, so I don't think it's. So I don't think you, you have converged. Okay, anyway, this is to think about it. Okay, I think I'm done. So I guess, yeah, I'll see you next next Tuesday. Yeah.